First five books of Moses, of course we know his Torah is his whole word, all the way from Breshit to Genesis. I mean from uh, Genesis, Breshit to Revelation. Also the half Torah, reading, half Torah simply means the reading of, uh, that we read from the prophets, the Nevim and the writings, the Brit Hadashar, our new covenant, uh, new covenant in English, uh, the Tanakh is an acronym for what sometimes we're referred to as the Old Testament, but it's the Torah, uh, the Nevim and the Ketuvim, the, uh, the law, the, the prophets and the writings. Uh, if you see a capital L-O-R-D, uh, majority of the time it's the initials Yod Vathe. We don't really uh, normally pronounce the other word uh, because we're not 100% sure, but L-O-R-D, uh, Adonai, uh, referring to Lord in English. Elohim is where we get the word God from. Ruach HaKadosh, Holy Spirit. Yeshua. Uh, of course, we know that we call him Jesus in the English translation from Isis in the Greek. And I'm Israel, or B'nai Israel, the people of Israel, which is the name that the Father told us to call this congregation. Amen. Uh, and we know that uh, the word church is really the ecclesia in Greek. It's really the congregation or the assembly of Israel. Amen. So let's turn to our four portion. It'll be in Breshit or Genesis chapter 18 and verse 1. Let's pray before we read. Abba Father, we're here today to honor you, to worship you, to thank you for all that you've done for us, Father. Father, we're here not to be seen of ourselves, but to see you, Father. Father, let Yeshua the Messiah be lifted up in the reading of your word, in the worship, and in everything that we do, because you said, be lifted up, you draw them in unto him. And we're here to see Yeshua lifted up, that those who have needs will come to him today and be delivered and set free and their needs met. And we give you praise and honor in Yeshua's name. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, Breshit, Genesis. Chapter 18 and verse 1. Now, Yodavah, the Lord, appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. And when he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, three men were standing opposite to him. Three men. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed down himself to the earth. Abraham, he was excited. He was sitting at the tent door. And he saw these men. Abraham is displaying, as we'll see as we go through this, a tremendous amount of hospitality. He's excited to see these three men, as it, as it says right here. And it says, and he said... My Lord, my Master, if now I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. He was willing to wash your feet, to see whatever they needed, to show great hospitality. And I will bring a piece of bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may go on since you have visited your servant. And they said, So do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly, quickly prepare three measures of fine flour, knit it, and make bread cakes. Abraham ran also to the herd and took a tender and choice calf and gave it to the servant, and he hurried to prepare it. And he took curds and milk and the calf which he had prepared and placed it before them. And he was standing by them under the tree as they ate. Now, it's just a little simple. I'm going to just give you some bread and all to eat. But he got excited, and he went, and he prepared a full meal for them. See, Abraham was really excited that they were here. Uh, it says, Then they said to him, Where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will surely return to you at this time next year, a specific time, this time next year. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. Remember that Abraham was about 99 years old and Sarah was about uh, 90 years old. Sarah was past childbearing. And Sarah laughed to herself saying, after I have become old, shall I have pleasure? My master, my Lord being old also. And Yodevav, the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Saying, shall I indeed bear a child when I am old? And he says this to Abraham, is anything too difficult for Yodebafe the Lord? At the appointed time, Boedim, at the appointed time that he said, I will return to you at this time next year. He says, 
I'm going to return to you at this time next year, at this set time. And Sarah shall have a son. Now, I want to share just a couple of verses out of the Brit Hadashai because of uh, Abra Abraham, Abraham and, uh, and his hospitality. I want to show us how important this is uh, to the body of Messiah, to the men and women of, uh, of, of Elohim of God. I want us to go to uh, 1, Timoth 1 Timothy chapter 3. It is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of an overseer, it is a fine work that he desires to do. An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, and hospitable, able to teach. Read out of Shai, coming from Torah. See, we want to look at hospitality, being hospitable and hospitality within the body of Messiah. This was one of the traits that Abraham, Abraham had. Let's also go to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. For the overseer must be above reproach as God's Elohim steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, nor pugnacious, not, nor, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, and self-controlled. Now, I know we have all these other aspects of what we need to be too, but I want to point out just how much this word is used over here in the Brit Hadashah, the New Covenant, about being hospitable. All right, let's go to 1 Peter, chapter 4. First Peter, chapter 4, verses 9, and I also want to read 10. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. Let me read that again. Because a lot of times, oh, oh God, you know I want to be hospitable, but you, know, you don't understand. You know how hard she or he is to get along with. That's not what it says. It's not a qualifier. It says be hospitable to one another without complaint. We need to be hospitable to one another without complaining about the other person. Amen? Because that gives the devil room to come in and cause division. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another, in serving one another. With all of us have a gift, a special gift, and we're to use it in doing what? Serving one another. As good stewards of the manifold grace of God of Elohim. Amen? All right, we got one more. Let's go to Romans 12, 13 before we get back to the Torah portion. Romans 12, 13. Contributing to the needs of of the believers, the saints, depending on your translation, the set-apart ones, the kadosh, the holy, practicing hospitality. Practicing hospitality. We as believers should have a spirit of the Messiah of practicing hospitality, of serving one another. Just like our father Abraham set this example way back here in Genesis. See, is he not the father of faith? And he's setting the example all the way back for us. And here it is being repeated from the from the Brit Hadashah in the New Covenant. Amen? Okay. Verse 15, I think, is where I left off at. I hope that was right. Sarah denied it, however, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, No, but you did laugh. Then the men rose up from there and looked down towards Sodom. The men rose up and looked down towards Sodom. And Abraham was walking with them to send them off. And Yodavah the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. 
For I have chosen him in order that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. You see, he's commanded to keep his way. What, what, it, you know, what, what was it called in the New Testament? The way. the way. The way. Even when Paul was before Felix and he was being accused of things that, uh, uh, that he was not guilty of, he said, listen, but according to the sect called the way, I'm guilty. I believe everything that's written in the Torah, the Naveen, and the Ketavim. Are we guilty of that today? I hope so. If we're not, we ought to be. So you see, he's the one way back here that said, you're going to keep my way, you're going to keep my words, and you're going to teach your children, and because of you, the nations of the earth will learn and be blessed. And it says that in order that Yodivafe the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. And Yodivafe said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly great. Now, this is interesting because he started off uh, telling Abraham and Sarah how that they were going to be blessed with a child when it was according to the flesh and the natural, according to the Brit Hadashai, they were already dead, technically, in the physical realm. But he, he, he made it clear to them, is anything impossible with me? Hallelujah. And we know that it's not. Hallelujah. If we have the faith that he had, Amen. and we believe what he said. Yes, on the natural, on the outside, and we're looking at the circumstances, the difficulties that we're facing, whether it be a, a spiritual issue, a, a physical issue, an emotional or financial issue, where is your faith? Where is my faith? Amen. Is it in the creator of the universe? If it is and we believe him, then what we see on the outside doesn't matter. If he speaks it, if he wills it, it will be so if we'll trust in him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's, so here we are. We're at this point, And all of a sudden now, there's another issue that pops right in the middle of this about an outcry down in a place called Sodom and Gomorrah. And he's thinking, shall I tell Abraham about this? After all... I have made him one that's going to be teaching the way of the Messiah, the way of my word, the way of truth to nations. And so he says, And Yodibaf the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly grave. Exceedingly grave. I mean, it's bad. And, 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 the, and the understanding of the words here is it's, it's very, diff, very bad. It says, I will go down now and see if they have done entirely according to its outcry, which has come to me, and if not, I will know it. Well, we remember another situation like this when they said, we will go down to see what's going on in Babylon. Huh? To see if it's really what I understand that it is. And we know what happened with that situation. Judgment ensued. It says, Then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom, while Abraham was standing before Yodavah the Lord. So those two of those three went down toward Sodom. And it says literally that Yodavah the Lord stayed there with Abraham. That's what it says. And Abraham came near and said, Wilt thou indeed wipe away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are fifty righteous within the city. Will thou indeed sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the fifty righteous who are in it? Far be it from thee to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? Wow, Abraham's having a conversation with him. So Yodavah the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare the whole place on their account. What is Abraham doing here now? Remember, he's going to be the father. He's interceding for Sodom. He is interceding. If there's righteous people in there, that it would be spared. Already he's taken on the role that he should take on, the role that Messiah, who is our what great intercessor, our high priest today, interceding for us at the right hand of the Father when we fall short. You see, he's our, Moses, the great intercessor for the people. I mean, they would have all been destroyed if it hadn't been for the many times that he interceded for the people of Israel in their wickedness. So, he's interceding. And Abraham answered and said, Now behold, I have ventured to speak to Adonai, though I am a, but dust and ashes. Suppose the fifty righteous are like in five. Wilt thou destroy the whole city before, because of the five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find forty-five there. 
How did he speak to him the second time? Oh, you know, humility, I'm nothing but dust and ashes. He understood he was dust and ashes. Do we understand today that we are created from the dust of the earth before him? That we need to understand our place, that we're but dust and ashes in his sight. He has created us. You see, so when we go before him, we need to go with all humility in our prayers and in what we pray and what we say and what we do. And he spoke to him yet again and said, suppose 40 are found there. And he said, I will not do it on account of 40. Abraham is really, really interceding for these people. Then he said, oh, may Adonai the Lord not be angry and I shall speak. Suppose 30 are found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And he said, now behold, I have ventured to speak to Adonai. Suppose... 20 are found there, and he said, I will not destroy it on account of 20. Then he said, Oh, may the Lord Adonai not be angry, and I shall speak just, just one more time. Can I just speak one more time? Humility. Suppose 10 are found there, and he said, I will not destroy it on account of the 10. And as soon as he had finished speaking to Abraham, the Lord departed, and Abraham returned to his place. Now the two angels came to Solomon in the evening as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. Remember who Lot was. Lot was Abraham's nephew, and Lot chose to go to a different place. Uh, he made a bad choice, as we all understand. And now he's in, and he's in the midst of, of a place of wickedness and turmoil. Let's read on. And he said, Now behold, my, my masters, my lords, please turn aside into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you, then you may rise early and go on your way. They said, however, no, but we shall spend the night in the square. Yet he urged them strongly. So they turned aside to him and entered his house, and he prepared a feast for them and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. So Lot's showing the aspects that he had learned from Abraham of a certain amount of hospitality. I don't think it was quite as much, but he is showing hospitality. Before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, both young and old, all the people from every quarter. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out so that we may have relations with them. You know, we're dealing with this in this society today, folks. You know, we're dealing with all kinds of sin. There's not one sin. Is, sin is sin. But the reality of it is that the homosexual agenda is so sticking out there, laws are being changed in their favor and laws are being changed against the true believer. You know, we're in a place sometimes that it just vexes our soul. It vexes my soul what I see happening. Not just with that, but with all the other things that are going on. We need for Yeshua to return soon, I pray. Hallelujah. I hope in our day and in our time. Amen. But Lot went out to them at the doorway and shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brothers, do not act wickedly. Now behold, I have two daughters who have not had relations with man. Please let me bring them out to you and do to them whatever you like. Only do nothing to these men as much as they have come under the shelter of my roof. Now a lot of people get upset about that. It seems like a hard word. I'm not going to pretend that I understand all there is about this. But I'm just saying that Lot's got to the place and he knows the responsibility of the authority when somebody comes under his roof, but yet still the responsibility of his daughters. I think he's a little confused maybe, you know, because he's been in Sodom too long. You know, a lot of us, we've been in Sodom too long. You know, he's not a Sodomite, but he's been in Sodom. He's been in Babylon too long, and his thinking is getting to kind of messed up a little bit of the way he's handling things. Anybody experience that with what we're dealing with today? Now, behold, I have found two daughters. Excuse me, I haven't read that. I'm going to go ahead and read it. Now, behold, I have found, I have two daughters who have not had relations with men. Please let me bring them out to you and do not harm them. Whatever you like, only do nothing to these men as much as they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, stand aside. Furthermore, they said, this one came in as an alien, a stranger, and already he is acting like a judge. Now we will treat you worse than them. So they pressed hard against Lot and came near to break the door break down the door. You know, it starts off, all we really want is for y'all just to accept us. Satan says, just just accept the little sin. Just accept the little leaven. You know, then, now we want you to marry us. Now we want you to marry us in your congregations because you have to. We want you to marry us even though you don't believe what, what we're doing. It's headed that way already in America. It's already in other places. 
That's the way it's headed. We need to be bold and strong and stand up for the Word of God because we're headed into very dark days, darker than we've ever seen before. Amen. And it says, But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves trying to find the doorway. Then the men said to Lot, Whom else have you here? A son-in-law and your sons and your daughters? And whomever you have in the city, bring them out of the place. Because what was the agreement with Abraham? If he finds ten righteous there, he'll spare the city. It doesn't look like right now the city is fixing to be spared, though, does it? For we are about to destroy this place because their outcry has become so great before Yodavav Hey the Lord that Yodavav Hey the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Judgment. There's a time when sin goes so far when it was a sin that was in the, in the land of Israel of the Amorites reached its pinnacle that Joshua and the sons of Israel were allowed to cross over and to possess the land and to destroy the inhabitants thereof. God will always do judgment when certain places reach a certain height, he will destroy it and he will use the people that he has prepared to do the destruction. It says, And Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-laws who were to marry his daughters and said, Get up, get out of this place, for Yodavav the Lord will destroy the city. But he appeared to his sons-in-laws to be jesting. You know, when you're in Sodom, when you're in Babylon a long time, and you really hadn't said a lot about God, you hadn't really shared the message, hardly anybody, well, when you do share a little something, and even when, you, when, you, when people have heard it, to them it's just a joke now. It's not serious anymore. Well, we're just living our lives. We're having a good time. You know, it's just all funny. You know, but they're fixing to find out it's not as funny as they think that it is. So they're, they, they're not going with it. Bottom line is they're not going. And when, and when the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. Up, take your wife and your two daughters, four people. Didn't meet the numbers. The, city's going, the city is going to go for its judgment. It's time for judgment to be rendered. But we see, nonetheless, that Abraham, he did what he could to intercede. And there wasn't enough of people there for the intercession to stop the judgment. But the interesting thing is this, that Lot and his two daughters and wife are allowed to leave under, under the protection of the Almighty. Lot, righteous Lot, refers to Lot as being righteous. But he, he just made a bad choice in the way he lived his life and where he went. But he was righteous enough for the Father to deliver him. But he hesitated. So the men seized his hand and the hand of his wife and the hands of his daughters. For the compassion of Yodivah was upon him, and they brought him out and put him outside the city. You know, when the time comes and the judgment's fallen, I wonder will we hesitate. I hope and pray that the mercy of the Creator is, if we do hesitate, that He will grab our arms and take us out. Mm -hmm. And it came about when they had brought them outside that one said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you and do not stay anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains lest you be swept away. But Lot said to them, Oh, oh, oh no, my, my masters, my lords. Now behold, your servant has found favor in your sight. And you have magnified your loving kindness, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains lest the disaster overtake me and I die. And now behold, this town is near enough to flee to, and it is small. Please let me escape there. It is not small that my life may be saved. And he said to him, Behold, I grant you this request also not to overthrow the town of which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. See? They said, I can't do anything until you arrive there. So God's provision for them was they had to be provided for. They had to, have, be, they had to get out of the place of destruction. Uh, they were being saved, so to speak, delivered from the destruction that was coming upon the city, and they had to be gotten out of there before he let the judgment fall. Hurry, escape. Let's read it again. Escape, therefore, I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the town was called Zor, which means small. The sun, had, the sun had risen over the earth when Lot came to Zor. Then Yodavavhe reigned on Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from Yodavavhe the Lord out of heaven. He overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. You know, I, I think of the prophets and I think of other times of judgment 
in the prophets, and I see in the book of Revelation a judgment by fire that's reserved, a fire for the end, where we see a, a similar picture of judgment on the earth with fire and hell and brimstone. Maybe it's nuclear, I don't know, but nonetheless, it's, it's, a, it's a great judgment to bring judgment upon this earth. But his wife from behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. She chose the wrong choice. She chose to look back. Will we look back? You know, I really think, did she just turn around and look back and that got her? Or did she really turn and go back? I don't know. I think she turned and went back. Maybe I'm wrong. Nonetheless, she did what she wasn't supposed to do, and, and it cost her her life. Now, Abraham wrote, because you know why she did it? Because any of us can be male or female. The love of the city, the things that's in the house, the material things that we had was more dear to her heart when the time came than obeying God and leaving all that behind and trusting Him to provide down the road. In America, we have a very similar situation. We have so much materialism here in this country. Would we be willing to leave it? If we, if we, need, if we found out we needed to leave tomorrow, could we leave it behind? Amen. Or do we hold it so dear that we just turn around and we just, I just can't leave this? Maybe this is not really God. Maybe we were really not, maybe my husband's making a bad choice. Maybe my wife's making a bad choice. We need to think about that. If we've got anything that we're not l willing to leave behind when we clearly know it's time to get out, I'm going to say a little word. It's called idolatry. Amen. I'll tell you why it's called idolatry. Because you're putting it before God. How are you putting it before God? You're disobeying Him when He's clearly made a provision for you to get out and your protection's there. Therefore, you love that more than you love Him and obeying Him. So it's idolatry. Idolatry will cause us to be destroyed. Idolatry will bring judgment upon us. I want y'all to pray for me tomorrow because I'm going to speak on the radio program about what is true revival. And I'm going to go through a number of scriptures. First of all, I'm going to define what true revival is. Because a lot of people listening out there today, everybody wants revival, especially within my Christian community and my brothers and sisters. But they never really understood what true revival was. The prophets brought true revival by the return and repentance to Shuva, to the house of Israel. You need to repent. You need to get the idolatry out of the house. You need to return to my Torah and keep it. And I'm going to share this tomorrow. Y'all pray for me that I'll be able to relate that to the hearers on the airwaves that they can find out, because most people really don't know what true revival is. They really don't. But his wife, verse 26, but his wife from behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. I just read that, my hand slipped. Now Abraham arose early in the morning and went to the place where he had stood before. And he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward the land of the valley. And he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land ascended like the smoke of the furnace. Thus it came about when Elohim God destroyed the cities of the valley that Elohim remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot lived. Abraham interceded in that saved Lot and his two daughters because of his intercession. I do believe that because they were righteous. And Lot went up from Zor and stayed in the mountains and his two daughters with him, for he was afraid to stay in Zor. And he stayed in the cave and his two daughters. Then the firstborn said to the younger, our father is old and there is not a man on the earth to come in to us after the manner of the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine and let us lie with him that we may preserve our family through our father. You see the justification here? They've been, they've been in Sodom too long. They don't really understand. They haven't been trained, apparently, even though Lot was their father, clear enough in the Torah that there's a justification going on here about lying with their father to preserve. You know, we in the communities today, we have a way of finding some Torah verse out and taking it out of context to do what we want to do, to go where we want to go and to justify it. We have to be very careful with doing that because it will lead to problems down the road. And it says, So they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went and lay with her father, and he did not know when she lay down and when she arose. 
And it came about on the morrow that the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I last night I lay last night with my father. Let us make him drink wine tonight also. Then you will go in and lie with him that we may preserve our family through our father. Incest. So they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him. And he did not know when she lay down and when she arose. Thus both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father. The firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. There it is, Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. And, and for the younger, she also bore a son and called his name ben -Ami. He is the father of the sons of Ammon to this day. So we see a lot of immorality within these communities. Of course, it's in all communities, but we see because of this situation that took place, it <coughs> continued on. Now Abraham journeyed from there toward the land of the Negev and settled between Kedish and Shur. Then he so journeyed in Gerar, and Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. So Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But Elohim, God, came to Abimelech in a dream of the night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is married. Now Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Adonai, wilt thou slay a nation, even though blameless? Did he not himself say to me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands, I have done this. Then Elohim, God said to him in the dream, yes, I know that in the integrity of your heart, you have done this. And I also kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet and he will pray for you, and you will live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. Now, this doesn't seem exactly fair, does it? Does it seem right that Abraham sort of planned a little deception here because he's worried about his own life? Was this a place where Abraham had maybe had a little lack of faith in God to protect him where he was going? You know, we could, we could surmise what all this is about all day long. But the reality of, of it is, is that he told at least a half-truth because she was his half-sister. But the bottom line is, is that God made an unconditional covenant with Abraham and the blessings flowing through Abraham. Even when he falls short and he has to do Teshuvah and repent, the blessing is flowing through Abraham. The gifts and the callings, ladies and gentlemen, are out repentance. So we need to understand that. So when Bebelech arose early in the morning and called all his servants and told all these things in their hearing. And the men were greatly frightened. And Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, Why have you what have you done to us? And how have I sinned against you that you have brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? You have done to me things that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What have you encountered that you have done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought surely there is no fear of God in this place and they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she is actually my sister, the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. And it came about when God caused me to wander from my father's house, and I said to her, this is the kindness which you will show me. Everywhere we go, say of me, he is my brother. And Bimelech then took sheep and oxen and male and female servants and gave them to Abraham and restored his wife, Sarah, to him. Now here's the interesting thing. How did Abraham leave? <laughs> he left with a lot of goods. He got, in spite of all this, he left, he was blessed, and he, he was given uh, sheep, his servants. I mean, he left blessed, just like the children of Israel when they left the land of Egypt. They took all, basically, a majority of the wealth of uh, Egypt with them. It says, and then Bimelech said, behold, my hand is before you. Settle wherever you please. And Sarah, he said, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Even a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, it is your vindication before all who are with you. And before all men, you are cleared. And Abraham prayed to Elohim to God. And Elohim healed Abimelech and his wife and his mates so that they bore children. For Yodivah, the Lord, had closed fast the wombs of the household of, of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. So the end result is good in spite of all the circumstances. 
This guy did fear God, and Abimelech feared him, and he did what he was supposed to do. And Abraham prayed for him after they had their discussion. You know, he wanted to know, why in the world did you do this to me? Well, here's my reason. And the bottom line is he prayed for him, and they were healed, and, 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 and both were blessed. Then Yodavah, the Lord, took note of Sarah, as he had said, and Yodavah, the Lord, did for Sarah, as he had promised. So Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the appointed time of which God had spoken to him. You know, he's never late. When he says an appointed time, he keeps it. Amen. That's why his Moedim, his fall festivals, his Shabbat, his Sabbaths are so important for us as the people of God. The people of Israel to obey him and to walk in his ways. And yes, when we walk in his ways and we do what he says, we're going to look different than what the rest of the world around us is doing. Mm -hmm. You know, we got here this morning and I love my Christian brothers here. But man, they were out there and they know we have Shabbat service and we, we had to wait to get in the driveway. They was having him a car wash and making money. You know, but God loves them. I'm praying for them. He's, they're, they're good people. We need to intercede for these people. We need to intercede for our people. We need to intercede that God will open all of our eyes to see the areas that we're falling short in and get the idolatry out of our lives and follow Him with our whole heart. Because you see, otherwise we're, we're deceived and we're walking down a wrong road. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac, Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac He's like when he was eight days old, as Elohim had commanded him. Abraham did what God said. Like, no, like, like Moses, he always did what God said. That's why he's considered the father of faith, because he believed and did what he said. You know, we have this Greco mindset that we deal with out here in our culture all the time that, well, I believe, philosophical ideals. I, I believe this and I believe that but we never act on it. So it's only in our mind. We really don't believe it. If we believe something, we will do it. We will walk it out and we will live it in every aspect of our life. Well, I believe God. I believe His whole Word. Do you believe the, all the Ten Commandments? Oh, yeah, absolutely. What about the fourth one? Oh, yeah, yeah, it changed the Sunday. Though. No, it didn't. But you see, all this justification is there. For all these changes, all the way way on back to the Council of Nicaea. All this just but God's word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change his mind, ladies and gentlemen. His word is an easy word. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. It's all the religious dogma, all the traditions of men that have been wrapped around his word to form their own form of righteousness that causes all the Babylonian confusion. If we'll get back to the book, to His Word, the simplicity of the Gospel is very clear cut. Line upon line and precept upon precept. He will teach us by the washing of the Word of His Word by the infilling of His Spirit as we go through His Word. That's why we go through these Torah cycles every year. Every year we go through oh, I didn't see that last year. That wasn't there last year. Yeah, it was. But you wasn't ready for it. I wasn't ready for it. God will only give us what we are ready for now and what we will apply now. If you want to know Him, if you want to walk in His fullness, then live out what He's already shown you. Don't expect Him to show you more if you're not living in what He's already shown you. Okay? Then Abraham circumcised, read again, then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old as Elohim had commanded him. Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. 100 years old. And Sarah said, Elohim, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. Now Sarah saw that the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, mocking. Therefore she said to Abraham, Drive out this maid and her son, for the son of this maid shall not be an heir with my son Isaac. And the matter distressed Abraham greatly because of his son. You see, Abraham loved, he loved his, his son too, you know. This whole situation didn't have to take place. But because, 
because of their going to help God out, not waiting on the promise. How many of us, if we heard God's word right, we heard it clearly, and two years pass by, three years pass by, five, ten years pass by, well, you know, I think I might need to help God out a little bit now because I know He promised this to me, and we get out in the flesh, and we try to figure out how we can help Him out. And it ends up in disaster. It ends up in heartache. It ends up in broken families. It ends up in a lot of things. But nonetheless, God is faithful. He forgives if we ask His forgiveness. But see, it doesn't mean that there's not consequences after the forgiveness for the sin. By this time, Abraham had long already dealt with this issue and been forgiven, and so had Sarah. But there's consequences for this sin, and they're starting to show up. They're starting to show up. But Elohim said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the lad and your maid. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her. This is one time it was okay for, for the man to listen to his wife. <laughs> Let me tell you something, man. When you're married, you're, you, you, you two are one. You got to always better listen to each other and pray. Amen. You know, we're being a little funny, but the reality is, Reality is we need to listen to each other and pray and see if it's God's will, okay? Not that, well, I'm, I'm, I'm the husband and I'm going to lord it over my wife, or the wife's trying to take the husband's place and trying to tell him what to do all the time. We need to put it in God's perspective and walk in obedience so that these problems will be solved. Listen to her, for through Isaac your descendants shall be named. God's making it clear to Abraham. Do what she wants done because Isaac's the chosen one. And the son of the maid I will make, and of the son of the maid I will make a nation also, because he is your descendant. Isn't that just like God? He's going to still bless the other lad. He's still going to make a nation out of him. You know? And it says, So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar, putting them on her shoulder and gave her the boy and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water in the skin was used up and she left the boy under one of the bushes then she went and sat down opposite him about a bow shot away for she said do not let me see the boy die and she sat opposite to him and lifted up her voice and wept and elohim heard the lad crying and the angel of elohim of god called to hagar from heaven and said to her what is the matter with you hagar do not fear for elohim for god has heard the voice of the lad where he is arise lift up the lad and hold him by the hand for i will make a great nation of him then Elohim, God, opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. And God, Elohim, was with the lad, and he grew, and he lived in the wilderness and became an archer. And he lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. So you see, as bad as all these circumstances are, God's working his, this out. You know, in the Bible... There's nothing that's hidden. The Father always shows not just everything that's perfect and good, but where man fails as well. And how that he has a provision to work the circumstances out if man will repent and listen to him and follow him. So a lot of things that's in the Bible say, well, someone told me one time, they said, well, this and this is in the Bible. That ain't right. I said, well, you know, God's not putting his approval on it. He's having to deal with humanity where they're not right. And work out a provision for them so that they can go on with life and can can get things corrected in their life. So we have to understand that God is He loves us so much that He sent His Son to die for us that we could all be redeemed, every last one of us, in spite of all our failures. And it came about that time that Abimelech and Pakol, the commander of his army, spoke to Abraham, saying, Elohim God is with you in all that you do. They recognize that. Now therefore swear to me here by God Elohim that you will not deal falsely with me or with my offspring or with my posterity, but according to the kindness that I have shown to you, you shall show to me and to the land in which you have sojourned. And Abraham said, I swear it. But Abraham complained to Abimelech because of the well of water which the servants of Abimelech had seized. And Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing, neither did you tell me, nor did I hear of it until today. And Abraham took sheep and oxen, and gave them to Abimelech. And the two of them made a covenant, an agreement, a covenant. Then Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. 
And in Bibelech said to Abraham, What do these seven ewe lambs mean which you have set by themselves? And he said, You shall take these seven ewe lambs from my hand in order that it may be a witness to me that I dug this well. Therefore he called the place Beersheba, because there the two of them took an oath. So they made a covenant at Beersheba, and in Bimelech and Pekol, the commander of his army, arose and returned to the land of the Philistines. And Abraham planted Tamar's tree at Beersheba, and there he called on the name of yod the everlasting Elohim, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned in the land of the Philistines for many days. Now it came about after these things that Elohim tested Abraham and said to him, and he said, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell you. This is referring to the Akedah, the binding of Isaac. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey. And we're probably not going to have time today to read it uh, because we have some guests here. But in the prophet's reading today, we'll see a similar story. And we'll see also where there's a saddling of a donkey. We'll see that the, that the sages and all chose the half tour portion for a reason. It really coincides with this. I hope that all of y'all have read that because I don't think we're going to have time to do it today. Anyway, it says, And took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place of which Elohim God had told him. On the third day, there's that number three again. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I... And the lad will go yonder, and we will worship and return to you. Well, I thought Abraham was going to sacrifice his son, but yet he says, we will return to you. Abraham believed God. Or he couldn't have made this statement. He couldn't have been this positive. He knew that although he obeyed God and he slayed him, and, and, and the how this child in the new covenant tells us this, that he would raise him from the dead. A picture of resurrection and life. And Abraham took, and he spoke it out of his mouth. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. It's a picture, it's a picture of Messiah. He took the tree that would be executed on. We see a perfect picture here. And Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, Elohim, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. We have to remember that Isaac was at least 30-something years old. So Abraham would not have been able at 100 years old probably to bind him up. He went willingly as Messiah went willingly for us. So again, we see that in the picture. Then they came to the place of which Elohim had told them, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of Yodibafe the Lord called on him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him, for now I know that you fear Elohim, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. Again, a picture of the the, the, the crown of thorns on Messiah's head. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Yodavavhe Jireh. The Lord will provide. It is said to this day, in the mount of Yodavavhe it will be provided. Then the angel of Yodavavhe, the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares Yodavavhe the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. And in your seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now, it says again, your seed shall possess the gates of their enemies. We go to the book of Judges, we see Samson. He was a judge of Israel. And we see how he literally took the gate of the city of Gaza. 
tore it off and walked off with it, possessed the gate of his enemy. There's lots and lots of things in here. We're having to do this fast today. We are just skimming lightly the surface of this portion today. Now it came about, excuse me, verse 19. Verse, let me read 18 again. And in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. This is a key scripture here. In your seed, the seed of Abraham, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. There's that word again, obeyed. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Obey in him. We can give our tithes and our offerings. We can come to all the surfaces. But are we obeying what he's telling us to do? Are we living according to his word? You know, we can put on a great show on outward, but if we're not walking in obedience to him, Amen. it's not going to do us any good. Right. We need to obey his voice to walk in his blessing. We're told over and over again in the Torah to hear the blessings and hear the curses. Amen. If you'll walk according to my word, you'll be blessed in all that you do. If you choose to walk in some of it, you'll be blessed in that area. If you choose to walk in the rest of the other areas, you're probably going to be cursed in that area. We understand we're not saved by our works. We're saved by faith in the atoning blood of Messiah. But because of our faith in Him, as we're taught by His Spirit through His Word, we will walk out what He shows us as true believers. We should desire. If His Spirit's in us, we have a desire to learn His ways and to walk in His ways so that we can walk in the blessing because we are the seed of Abraham if indeed we are in Messiah. So Abraham returned to his young men to his young men and they arose and went together to Bathsheba and Abraham lived at Bathsheba now it came about after these things that it was told Abraham saying behold Milcah also has born children to your brother Nahor Buzz his firstborn and Buzz his brother and Kemuel the father of Aram and Kased and Hazo and Fildash and Zidlaf and Bethiel and Bethiel became the father of Rebekah these eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. And his concubine, whose name was Rumah, also bore Teba and Gaham and Tahash and Makkah. 